diabetes um, and blood sugar related problems okay and, and and when I say that that goes the gamut from everything from hypoglycemia to pre-diabetes to metabolic syndrome the syndrome X and and and, and then diabetes and there are different types of diabetes there's type 2 diabetes and there's type 1 diabetes now there's this late onset diabetes we're going to talk about that and uh, and and even I'll tell you about what they're calling type 3 diabetes okay in just a few minutes all right so let's get started if you haven't already I ask you please just silence or put your cell phones on vibrate and then we won't have any interruptions we'll be able to just roll and get the information that we need tonight to help to change our life and so our approach tonight to go along with what y'all you were talking about are, are functional nutrition and functional neurology's role in handling chronic illnesses, but specifically tonight, blood sugar problems and type 2 diabetes, all right? This will tell you a little bit about it. Can everybody see this? I think this thing's a little bit in the way here. Let's move it over slightly so you can see that okay there, Mr. Kenneth. Let's tell you a little bit about my training. Uh, you know, people always ask me about, you know, what all those letters behind the name mean and what that means is I spent a lot of money and a lot of miles and a lot of time to try to learn some things to help you. And um, and I'll tell you a little bit about my story, okay? When I graduated chiropractic college in 1992, as most people that graduate any professional type school, you know, you're, you're ready to put what you learned into action. And I did that for a number of years. And, um, and then you began to realize that there's more things that you need to learn. And so the first thing I, I did was around, um, uh, I would say late 90s, uh, maybe a few years after I graduated, I said, I have to become a master at structural correction. Because I kept seeing these people coming in with forward head syndrome and straight necks and reverse curves. And, and they never really taught us in chiropractic college how to deal with the underlying problem with those. And so I began to study and spent years learning how to master the correction of the spine and, and began to restore proper alignment. Well, and you know what? That got us a lot better results. They were tremendous. And then I still noticed, though, Bill, I had people that were still struggling with things and they weren't uh, doing as well as, as I thought they should have. And so I began, and, and just by the providence of God, I met a, a, a man named James Chestnut. And um, Dr. Chestnut began to teach me about wellness science. And that there's a science to wellness. In other words, we can really study what it takes to be and maintain wellness. And so I got all about, I studied that. I became a certified wellness practitioner. And we've just seen our, again, results improve tremendously. But unfortunately, even with practicing the wellness techniques, there are some chronic illnesses that still did not respond as fast or as well as we wanted them to. And so I began then to explore ways to handle chronic illnesses naturally using functional neurology. I began to study at the Carrick Institute, the American Functional Neurology Institute. I graduated from there and uh, I studied neurofeedback and then of course nutrition. And I started going through the, the uh, training at Apex Energetics and, uh, and it ultimately ended up becoming a board certified um, in, in integrative medicine. So that's basically where you take everything together and use it to make it work for the individual person. That's taking an individual person, what their illness is, finding out what's causing it, and then specifically applying the tools that you have to their problem to get them doing better. And the thing was, what I learned is, the more tools I had in my toolbox, Kenneth, the more I could do. And that's basically what's driven me from uh, you know, basically the last 20 years has really been a, it's been a 20 year journey and uh, through, and it's not over. I mean, I'm still studying. I'll be honest with you. Matter of fact, uh, on the 30th of this month, I fly to Australia and I'm going to be uh, over there spending three days in a functional neurology symposium in Australia. And then I'm going to be uh, doing some speaking while I'm over there as well. And so I, I'm excited about it. I get to do a little vacation as well. So but um, the, the education doesn't stop. It just, it's progressive. And um, so we're going to take and apply some of the things that I've learned from some great doctors like Dr. Karazi and Dr. Michael Johnson and some of the training that I've had. And we're going to apply them to your situation. Now, here's the first thing you must understand. Diabetes and blood sugar problems is not that much different than other chronic illnesses. In other words, they all have similar threads. If you look at all the different possibilities of things that may be going wrong, you will see that they have a lot of overlap. 
Okay, and so when we start to uh, uh, evaluate this, we'll get into some of those things and see how the thyroid ties into this, how the adrenals tie into this, and that answers your question about stress, and boy, stress is a major player, see? And here's what we're going to have to do. We're going to have to determine the neurologic side and the metabolic side, okay? Because in, the, in order to help chronic conditions, you're going to have to address both of these, and this basically means your brain and nervous system, and this means your, abil your body's ability to take in food and produce energy. Now, glucose is the primary source our body uses for energy. The cells take glucose and they make ATP, okay? Your brain burns glucose, prefers to burn glucose. It can burn fat, but it's its primary energy source along with oxygen, and that's critically important as well. So, we'll talk about that a little bit more, but here's the question. 30% of all the energy that your body produces goes to only one system of your body. Guess which one it is? Can you figure it out yet? I'll give you the answer. It's your nervous system. <laughs> your brain is a gas guzzler. It burns up that fuel like crazy, okay? But it's doing a lot. And here's the thing. Your brain is the most energy dependent of your entire body. It's the most nutrient dependent. And it's the most toxic uh, sensitive. Okay? So... Toxins that get in your body are going to affect your brain more than anything else. Any nutritional deficiency is going to affect your brain more than anything else. Any lack of ability to produce energy is going to affect your brain more than anything else. Okay? So ultimately, the brain is a critical part of our health. And I'm going to tell you something. Blood sugar, well, look here. Bad blood sugar, bad brain. Period. Okay? And uh, we'll talk more about that in a second. So how about this diagnosis of diabetes? Okay? How do you get this? Well, there's different ways you can get it, but the primary way most people think about is this fasting glucose level, right? You get over that mark of 126 on more than one study. It's supposed to be more than one study, fasting, and you're diagnosed with diabetes. Now, that can be reversed, by the way. That's the good news, okay? But there's other ways you can do it. HA1C is actually 6.4, I believe now, is, is the marker if it's over that. And then, of course, uh, after eating, if it's over 200 in two hours, that's another diagnosis. So what about this pre-diabetic? I heard several of you say you were borderline. That's anything with blood sugar fasting over 100, less than 126. And you know what that means? Trouble. It's come, trouble's already here, but there's more of it coming. And you're wise to be sitting here tonight and try to do what you can do to take control of this. As Bill said, I want to learn some preventative things tonight. I don't want this thing to get any worse. I want to take control of my health and I want to take control of especially this blood sugar issue in my brain because it's affecting your brain. Now, here's some stats. We'll go through these quickly. But there's about 24 million at least back in 2007 uh, and there's a lot more that are undiagnosed. A whole lot more. You can double that number. People that don't know, okay? It's the leading cause of blindness in the U.S. How about that? Leading cause of kidney failure. 60 to 70 percent have this condition, which we deal with all the time in our office, called peripheral neuropathy, okay? Because 6.5 HA1C, 6.5, write this down. This is a take home message. 6A1C above 6.5 means nerve die. 6.5 nerves die. And this has to do with um, osmotic pressure and a whole lot of different things that happen when this blood sugar goes up like that, okay? But um, uh, sexual dysfunction is the most common symptom, right along with peripheral neuropathy, 60 to 70%. And then, of course, you got skin problems and all kinds of other things because you got bad circulation. So you're losing those small vessels and you're getting circulation issues. Skin discolorations, I see all the time, chronic sores and things like that. So here's how your body uses blood sugar, okay? Blood sugar, of course, if food's broken down, you're getting nutrients, you're getting all these different things. Glucose is made, and uh, glucose needs to get into the cell. So it needs an escort. To get into the cell, it, insulin takes it by the arm, and it takes it to meet the receptor on the cell. The receptor receives the insulin and glucose in, and the body it gets into the cell, and now it can produce, the cell can produce ATP. It can do what it's supposed to do, and it can keep your body healthy and strong, right? Well, here's what happens. 
when insulin, uh, when glucose levels go low, your body produces something called cortisol from your adrenal glands to get glycogen out of store and break it down so that your body can have glucose because it's got to have energy, particularly your brain, right? Well, guess what else happens if your cortisol level goes up even if your blood sugar is already high? It still breaks down more glycogen, higher blood sugar. Okay, so get a picture of this, guys, okay? So we need this blood sugar. Optimal levels are between 85, oops, excuse me, 85 and 99, okay? So let's say that it's um, been three or four hours since we ate. Maybe, you know, maybe longer. All of a sudden, our blood glucose level starts to drop down to 80 or maybe 70s, okay? So your cells are saying, especially your brain, Hey, hey, <laughs> what's going on around here? We need some energy. So your adrenals, it talks to, your brain talks to the adrenal glands and said, fire it up, guys, fire it up, produce some cortisol, okay? So you get some cortisol, which is a hormone. It does a lot of different things, but one of the things it does is it's going to go to the liver and uh, other places like muscles, and it's going to break down glycogen, and glycogen is going to then become glucose and then it's going to be elevated in the bloodstream. So really, see, you're, you, besides just like the initial hour or so after eating, your blood sugar should stay this all the time. So if it's been six hours since I ate, 12 hours since I ate, or if it's been two hours since I ate, we still should be in this range. You see, because the body has this maintenance type system that God's given us, okay? But guess what the problem is? If this is elevated, Norvella, too much, glucose is going up. You got it? Because it's going to do its job. It's going to break down glycogen because that's what, one of the things it's, cre it's created and designed to do, okay? So this is what happens. Stress, adrenal stimulation, increased cortisol, increased blood sugar. People with stress have blood sugar issues, right? Hey, Zoe. So what kind of lifestyle issues might cause insulin resistance? Because here's what happens. When your blood sugar goes up chronically, Remember, now the, the blood sugar is going to come along with insulin, okay? So the glucose is going to attach to insulin, okay? And then it's going to come over here to this cell with this receptor. And these guys are going to come in here so they can get into the cell, right? When there's a whole bunch of this going on, these cells say, nope, you ain't coming in here. We got way too much already. And now we're shutting down. So you got a lot of this going on out here in the blood, but you got none going on in here because the receptor said there's too much. This is how diabetes starts. It starts with this insulin resistance. Okay, is that making sense? Okay, it's kind of like I like to use the analogy of of uh, of the ears because if the ears get around loud sound for long periods of time, do they hear better or worse? <laughs> They quit listening, right? They, the membrane hardens and it quits moving so much so that you can deafen that sound. And so that's what, the, that's what the receptors do. They say, whoa, we ain't taking any more. Okay, so you got all this blue glucose now and insulin floating around in the bloodstream. And here's some causes of it. Well, going too long between meals, you can get insulin surges. That's why it's better to have a more smooth delivery, especially if you already can't regulate your blood sugar. You need to have smooth delivery. Eating too many carbs. This is critical because then you got this big time insulin surge and then you got the bottom out and now you got to kick your adrenals in and you got to try to kick it back up again. And so you're on this roller coaster. Man, you feel terrible. Uh, consuming too much sugar, same thing, okay? Uh, you know, the average American, we consume 150 pounds of sugar in a year. Uh, lack of exercise. Exercise helps increase insulin sensitivity. So exercise is a wonderful friend, but let me caution you here. If you got diabetes, you can't do too much exercise because you don't have a good ability to produce energy. Remember, you can't get glucose in here. You can't make ATP. So if you go out and you burn, boy, you say, man, I'm going to get into that exercise and you hit it really hard. See you later. You're going to be down for about two days because it's going to take you two or three days to get ATP made up again. You're going to feel like you got ran over by a train. So you have to do a little bit of exercise, but then work it up over time. And that's based on how bad your blood sugar issues are and your adrenal function. And then, of course, stress. This is where Novella asked right here. 
stress is going to cause cortisol, cortisol release. So all these play a role in why this insulin resistance begins, okay? And um, the bottom line is insulin resistance leads to this. Fatigue, because you're not producing uh, ATP, right? Uh, increased triglycerides. How many people got high tri triglycerides in here? Or do you even know? Don't know, unfortunately, right? That should be checked because that's a critical thing, okay? Cholesterol, LDLs are going to be high, and guess what this means? You're always hungry because you got this leptin, increased leptin response that goes on because of this insulin resistance. And so now you're hungry more. It's a bad deal all the way around. And so, and here's the, here's the medical solution. Let's give you more insulin. Wait a minute, I thought we said we already had too much insulin out here and that's why the, shell, the cells, uh, the receptors shut down and now we're just going to give it more? We're going to say, hey, you're going to open up one way or the other. <laughs> it's not really a good model because here's what happens. More insulin use, okay, insulin increases, it bombards the cells that are not listening, but here's what else it does. Look, high insulin levels cause more inflammation, weight gain, as we were just asked well ago, Blood pressure goes up, risk of cardiovascular disease goes up, stroke, cancer, your testosterone goes down if you're a man, it goes up if you're a woman, and of course, unfortunately, insulin is toxic to the brain. We're going to get into that right now because um, this is very important to realize. Once the day you get on insulin, your life changes forever. It's, it's never the same. Here's what it looks like. So you eat food, you make insulin, cells resist insulin, Sugar stores as fat, you gain weight, you feel tired, and guess what else? Unfortunately, you got more leptin, so you feel hungry. And so then you eat food. And that's the cycle. Okay, it's a vicious, vicious cycle, and it never ends until you begin to solve some of the underlying problems. So here's some other things involved in controlling blood sugar. Your pancreas, of course. We know the pancreas is producing insulin, right? Okay. Your adrenals. We already talked about that because of cortisol. Your thyroid helps with glucose metabolism. This is very important. If you don't have good thyroid, thyroid is like the spark plug in that cell. So you can't burn up the glucose that's in there and use it if you don't have good thyroid. So when thyroid's bad, triglycerides go up, glucose goes up. And typically, usually, cholesterol goes up as well. Uh, liver, it's a major storage site of glycogen. And then gut function because of not only your immune system, but because of inflammation. So you got to have all these things and know how they're doing. That's important because there are other parts. And then here's some of the adrenal stressors. You were asking uh, a while ago about how do we manage. Well, emotional stress is not, in, in mo across the board, it's not our biggest stressor. Now, some, for some people it is. They just have a stressful life, okay? They got a lot going on or whatever. But um, these are much bigger issues here. These uh, hidden food sensitivities, sensitivities to like gluten, dairy, these are causing all kinds of problems with your blood sugar and you don't even realize it. Uh, gut infections, poor diet, of course, anemia, and then, of course, emotional stress. These are all things that cause adrenal gland to produce more cortisol, which then drives up your blood sugar even more. Only one of those you notice was diet. The other ones were other problems. So a lot of times we think it's all diet, but it's not always all diet. Okay? There could be other major factors. So high cortisol, right here, insulin resistance, guarantee. Liver malfunction, alcohol, bad diet, medications, elevated glucose, no doubt about it. Okay? Thyroid problems, we already talked about. Typically, they're not diagnosed well because doctors don't run the right test and then they don't look at the right ranges. I just had a person today, I went over a lab today and um, they, uh, you know, they're in that range where the medical doctor says everything's okay, but it's not a healthy range. We're gonna get to that in a second, I'll show you. It's gotta look at the right test and look at the right values. And here's the worst thing I think about these chronic illnesses, and especially diabetes, is they're progressive. They get worse. It's like I was telling a guy today with peripheral neuropathy. He is diabetic, but he has also a back problem that's contributing to his peripheral neuropathy, probably some other things going on as well. But I said, here's what I know. If you don't do anything, it will get worse. They're progressive. And so, diabetes is now called type 3 excuse me, Alzheimer's is now called diabetes type 3 or diabetes of the brain. 
there was some research. I actually heard this today. I was listening to a guy talking, and he said uh, he was a researcher, and he, and he was he was on the bandwagon of blood sugar has nothing to do with Alzheimer's and neurodegenerative diseases. He was on that for a long time until the evidence just got overwhelming, and then finally, at least he had enough character to say, "Yeah, totally." <laughs> he said, "Totally, I was wrong. It's totally related because the the, the brain the, the insulin is literally too much insulin is toxic to your brain." Okay, and um, the brain, again, being the most energy sensitive, if you have a drop in energy, it's going to affect the brain tremendously. And then sexual dysfunction, we already talked about that. It's all about the nerve flow and about the blood flow. Big problem. So here's the cycle. Okay, so cells become resistant to insulin. Cortisol levels increase. Sugar piles up, which means more fat, by the way. We already said that. And then you get swelling of the nerves and taxing of the pancreas. So you begin to get the peripheral neuropathies. And here's the thing about peripheral neuropathies. When you think of peripheral neuropathies, what do you all think of? Pain in the feet and hands, right? Did you know also peripheral neuropathies can affect all kinds of other nerves? Like we're talking about sexual dysfunction and about other nerves and constipation. And a lot of these things are associated with nerves that are not healthy and functioning right. And people don't realize that that's related. And uh, of course, balance and, and uh, things like that are huge. So here's the other side. Now this is the autoimmune side, this latent autoimmune. So here's what happens. So somebody's cruising through life and um, they don't have any signs of diabetes and all of a sudden they get to be in their 40s or whatever and all of a sudden they, they end up diabetic. And they're like, well, what happened? Well, what they're finding out is there's been this autoimmune condition that's cranked up and it's been causing more and more and more damage to the pancreas and eventually now all of a sudden they can't maintain their blood sugar anymore. See, and most of these people, by the way, their diet may be pretty good. They may not be overweight. They may not have high stress. They've got an autoimmune problem. And this is at least 20%. It could be a whole lot more than that. Uh, and initially, they may be thin until, of course, their insulin begins to go up long enough, and then they'll begin to put more store sugar as fat again, and, and problems like that begin to happen. They have this antibody right here. This GAD65 antibody is the one that uh, affects it most commonly. So it's important to catch it early. And... Um, so here's some signs. Because of the GAD antibody, they also a lot of times have anxiety and they also have um, uh, balance issues. Sometimes vertigo, dizziness. Sometimes they just have poor balance or they may be clumsy because the GAD also affects the cerebellum. So when I see somebody comes in, they got a lot of cerebellar signs and they tell me that they're diabetic, I'm thinking, whoa, we might need to check this. You see, this could be an autoimmune condition. By the way, did you know that... Um, uh, I skipped that, but beta blockers and other drugs can affect your blood sugar. There's a whole list of them there. And then, and then of course, here's the treatment that's initially performed first, right? Okay? But here's the problem. It still neglects the root cause of your problem. And then it causes the pancreas to stop listening. Okay? And here's all the side effects, and there's tons of them. And you all know that. Nobody really wants to be on those, typically. You know what I'm saying? But a lot of times they don't know what else to do. And so my job is to try to give you some other options today and talk to you about what can be done. Okay, now, here's the five most important markers to find out if you got blood sugar or glucose problems. The fasting glucose we talked about, HA1C, this is the best marker to give me an average of what it's been over the last 120 days. So HA1C looks at the red blood cell bill and how much blood sugar it's been exposed to over its life and the average red blood cell lasts 120 days so really what i'm finding out is what's your blood sugar been over the last 120 days see so it's a good long-term marker because when i take a fasting glucose that's a snapshot that's what it was right there right there when they took that blood out see and so it's not always the best marker okay and now if i take two or three of them like that and they all come up with a problem we know that's that's not good but the HA1C is a really good conclusive marker. And then, of course, triglycerides need to be checked, cholesterol and LDLs, because remember, they're going to be affected by that as well. And now here's the keys. I'm going to give you several things that will be very important to your recovery. All right. Number one, you're going to have to control insulin and cortisol levels. OK, so just from what you've already learned, tell me what's going to affect insulin levels. Remember going back to that sheet where I said, hey, here's some things that you can do, that slide. What's some things that affect insulin levels? Not eating often enough, 
eating the wrong stuff. Okay, so you, if you don't eat long, go too long between meals. If your size of your meals matters too, by the way, because you can have an insulin response even from the good foods if you have too much of them, okay? Uh, and then, of course, if we have a lot of carbs and sugar, we're going to have an insulin surge, okay? We're going to, because the insulin, the glucose is going to go up so fast, insulin's going to have to go up to try to get it down, and then you got this cell saying, whoa, we got way too much again, okay? So, and then um, thyroid and liver, remember how important those are, gut function. These are the things that you're going to have to get a handle on. Are these involved? Uh, and if so, what do we need to change to make these things work properly, okay? And not all three of those are going to be involved with every person. But I guarantee you a couple of them are usually. Um, here's some things right now. Okay, I recommend you write some of these things down. Okay, number one. So far as diet goes, these are killers. So anything that's highly refined, uh, any highly refined sugar, high fructose, corn syrup, even agave, which is, these are, this is a really strong natural sweetener can affect your blood sugar. Artificial sweeteners. Now, wait a minute. They said artificial sweeteners, they don't have any sugar in them. So why does that affect your blood sugar? Chemicals. Chemicals? And wait a minute. Did that taste sweet? Okay, but wait a minute. How did you know that was sweet? The brain sensed that was sweet. Do you think your brain, when it tastes something sweet, knows to tell your pancreas to produce more insulin? Of course. So it doesn't matter. You still get an insulin response whether it's a chemical or not. That's a problem. And by the way, they are toxic to the brain. You should not be taking in those artificial sweeteners, especially aspartame. And that is a uh, literally, a it will burn your brain cells up, okay? Uh, eat frequent small meals. Okay, one of the deals with all my uh, diabetics I work with right here, this is a no-no. <laughs> that's got to go, you know. And I'll tell you, boy, sometimes that's like, whew, man, you have to fight on that because they're addicted to that Diet Coke. They're completely addicted to it. And, uh, and it is an addiction. I mean, it can be broken. It needs to be broken. By the way, let me share this. This is totally not related to diabetes, but I think this is critical because I know a lot of people who have blood sugar issues get in this trap of taking these artificial sweeteners. If you have, if the artificial sweetener um, changes you neurologically in any way, that means it hypes you up, if it uh, makes you feel uh, more calm, if it, it makes you uh, have a headache or feel lightheaded or anything like that, Here's what we know. You have a blood-brain barrier breach because the aspartame is not supposed to cross the blood-brain barrier. It's too big. If it gets into the brain, that means that you got other problems besides just that toxic chemical that you're putting in. You see, you got bigger problems with that. Same thing with MSG. If MSGs really affect your brain neurologically, it's because you got a leaky brain. You got a blood-brain barrier that's letting things in that shouldn't be getting in there, and that needs to be fixed. And that's usually an inflammatory or infection issue. Can be fixed. So then we need to eat lots of protein. The rule for my diabetics is 25 to 30 grams of protein in the morning for breakfast. You'd be surprised how much better you do with that. The ones that are on our program, I take them through a couple of different drinks, one in the morning, one in the evening, to get uh, their, their blood sugar under control. Uh, avoid stimulants, because guess what stimulants do? What do they cause to kick in? Your adrenals, which produce what? Cortisol, which then does what to your blood sugar? <laughs> so stimulants are bad for blood sugar issues, right? That's why the hypoglycemics got to have their coffee because they got to get their blood sugar up. Uh, exercise. This again, start taking it up to this point. This is a this is a end stage game right here. This is where you get to, but not where you start. Okay. 20 minutes a day will help your insulin uh, cells be help your cells be more sensitive to insulin. And then there's some nutritional support that you can take to specifically start getting the receptors sensitive to the insulin and the glucose again. See, because this is where a lot of people mess up, or I say give up. They change their diet, and then they get frustrated because nothing major really happens for them. And then they just give up and they go back. But sometimes they're, they're doing the right things 
and it just the cells need some help to get sensitive to the insulin again so that it can start to maintain it properly again and get the energy into the cells the glucose in the cell to produce ATP so there are some nutritional support that's been, that's been proven uh, in the literature and some of the different products that we use to help do that all right so what are the neurologic consequences? I'm always going to be talking about the brain. Y'all know that, okay? But the brain is going to be affected. It's the, it's the number one thing, in my opinion, that affects uh, the most common thing that affects the brain probably in our society because we have so much blood sugar problems, okay? So many different types of blood sugar problems. So it's going to decrease sensory input to all the brain. It's going to cause dysfunction. And it's going to cause vascular problems. So you can literally end up with areas of the brain that don't get enough oxygen. They don't get enough blood. That's a major problem, and it's going to cause ultimately neurodegeneration. That's the bottom line, okay? So, your brain again, we already talked about all this, okay? Now let's talk about this. Here's the two biggest things that stimulate your brain right here. Touch and gravity. And the third thing is light. So why? Because gravity is pulling down on your spinal joints, and they're firing proprioceptive nerve stimulation to your brain to keep your brain fired up and strong. Touch does the same thing. Movement does the same thing. Uh, that's why exercise is a good stimulation for the brain. Stretching. And then, of course, light. Light is a strong stimulus also. Okay. So here's how the brain works. We're going to go through this quickly. Cerebellum fires into the cortex, which fires into the brain stem, which keeps your autonomic nervous system balanced. If your autonomic nervous system gets out of balance, sympathetics kick in, go back to see cortisol, see high glucose again. Right? So you have to keep a good autonomic and brain balance. And by the way, I'm going to go through a couple of things, what happens here. This is what happens if you don't have good input to the cerebellum, then you don't have stimulus up here, then ultimately now you end up with an overfiring midbrain, which is the mesencephalon, okay? And when that happens, that's your sympathetics. So you don't have the break of your sympathetic. And then you get this overfiring uh, sympathetic system, and you end up with this high cortisol and now you can't maintain your blood sugar either okay so let's take a look at this this is the most common symptoms of an overfiring sympathetic system increased pain irritable bowel or constipation urinary tract infections fibromyalgia migraines because of blood flow to the brain or lack thereof posture and adrenal gland stimulation now this is very important follow me here Guess what diabetics struggle with? Depression issues. You know why? Because their frontal lobe's slowing down. You know why? Because they're not getting energy. They're not getting stimulation. They're getting a lot of loss of input. Uh, so all of this is associated with upper brain fatigue and even a beginning of early degeneration. So you got trouble finding your words. The math becomes more difficult. Uh, you don't understand what people are saying as easy. They have to repeat things. Your memory, of course, begins to go, which this can be temporal lobe as well. Uh, lack of focus is a huge problem. You get this brain fog. You get changes in handwriting, which I had a guy tell me this week. He's a peripheral neuropathy patient, and his frontal lobe's going. He's starting to get a tremor, and he's noticing, man, my handwriting's gone to pot. Uh, weakness, lack of motivation, major problem, and then ultimately all these ADD problems, okay? So these are the causes, not just blood sugar, but now look, oxygen deficiencies, food sensitivities, which mean inflammation, immune system imbalance, which means autoimmunities, uh, uh, cortisol, thyroid, infections. Infections are a big problem. You think that just if, when you get an infection, you're going to have a temperature. Nope. That's an acute infection. There's a difference between how your body responds to acute infection and a chronic infection. A chronic infection is lying underneath the surface. You don't necessarily know it's there, but your immune system and your body's having to deal with it every day. The most common place we have them is from our mouth. Second is gut. Gut and mouth. Those probably go hand in hand. Okay? So we need proper testing. Now let's talk about the labs real quick. We're about to finish here. Okay? Stay with me because here's why your medical doctor is not finding some of these problems until you already have a disease or a condition that he's going to drug you for, okay? Because he's looking at lab values. Lab values mean once it gets outside these areas here, you're outside the averages of everybody that goes in the lab, now you've got some kind of condition uh, or disease, right? How many people think really that everybody that goes into the lab is healthy? Is that possible? No. 
Did you know most of the people who go into the lab are not healthy? <laughs> so guess what you end up with? Wide ranges. Some people go in there hypoglycemic. Some people are diabetic. You got ranges from 300 to 50. Okay? So, guess what? You end up with a wide range. Because we're taking an average of all those people. What, who made them the, 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 what we should be taking our averages from? Bad idea, right? So you end up with a wide range. So what we do is we look at functional ranges. These are where healthy people should be and are, okay? Now, this right here is the area where your medical doctor is missing it when it starts because he says everything's okay, but you're already starting to have symptoms and problems and you may not even know it yet. You see? This is where it's being missed. An example is thyroid, glucose. Like glucose, okay, is a good one. Uh, that's what we're talking about now. The typical uh, range for is 60 to 65 for the low end, okay, and then anywhere from 100 to 115 or higher for the upper end, okay. And so the average number, the healthy number, is right here. If you're outside this, you got problems, okay. Even if you don't have diagnosed with the illness yet. Now here's the, here's the thing for your brain. Good glucose, good oxygen, activation. That's what you need. That's why we treat patients metabolically and neurologically, okay? So then you take all the pieces of the puzzle. Huge, but not the only puzzle, right? You put all these things together, you got the best chance of getting the body healthy, getting the brain firing right again, and getting back on track and rechecking things, guys. Well, my diabetics, I might run HA1C and, and glucose, I might run it three times in the, in the first three months, you know, because I want to see it dropping. HA1C is a long-term marker, but I can see changes in a month. Pretty significant changes, typically. And blood glucose? Now, a lot of people are checking their blood glucose already constantly, right? Um, it's nothing to see, really, it drop 30 to 100 points in a few weeks. You know what I'm saying? That's not hard at all. You know I'm saying? The, the thing is, now you've got to get the cell sensitive again so it can maintain at that level. Because otherwise, it'll just go right back up. Because you go back to your, you know, you give up. You say, man, I'm stuck there or whatever, and nothing's changing. My energy's not coming back. I still got all these other symptoms. And you get disappointed. You get discouraged, and you quit. And that's, you know, that's not good. And, and you also need somebody to keep you on track. You know what I'm saying? Honestly, you need somebody to help keep you on track. And that's what we do with our patients, okay? So here's, here's my deal, okay? This is what I recommend for a diabetics, okay? Number one, if you, now all of you guys are, almost all of you guys are patients, okay? You've probably had a neurologic eval, okay? You may have, I may have looked at labs, or maybe not. We may need to look at labs. Some of these other things you may have done. But we still got to see, number one, I got to rule out peripheral neuropathies. I think that's important, okay? But the biggest thing is we got to see where you're at, what the underlying causes are, and how are we going to address this and then get started on the program. That takes me about two days. I'd like, I'd like to do the evaluation, then I do the report and the recommendations, okay? And typically, if you're a brand new patient, this is what I charge, okay? Now, if you're, if you're an established patient, okay, this is what I'm gonna charge you, 75 bucks, okay? If you're, uh, as a matter of fact, I'll do it for, for you too, sir, okay? Since you're, you're here tonight, okay? If you're not working with me already nutritionally and you want to work with me nutritionally, in other words, if you want me to look at your labs, find out what the problems are, make recommendations for diet, nutritional support, and so forth, then I will do that for you, okay? And I do work on three and six month or four and eight month programs. And a four month program is going to involve an, a, at least one lab or sometimes two. It's going to involve about six intensive nutritional and lifestyle counseling sessions over a period of about four months. At the beginning, I'm going to give you a two-week assignment. And then I'm going to see you in two weeks, and I'm going to give you another two-week assignment. And then I'm going to see you in two weeks, and I'm going to give you another two-week assignment. And then if you're doing really good, I might not see you for a month. Because now you've got it. See, now we got it turned around. Usually in six to eight weeks, we can begin to see it turn around. Isn't that right, Zoe? Isn't that what you noticed? Yeah. So... How much weight did you lose, Zoe, in the, probably the first two months? Um, I'll around 45 pounds. 45 total? Mm -hmm. Probably lost about half of that in the first... Half of that in that 45 days. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like 
Because her issue was, see, it was a finding issue. She had a food sensitivity and she had inflammation because of that. And so that once we, we got those foods out, we got her in her. And your HA1C was um, sixes, I think, right? Yeah. yeah. So so we and we, we were still working on that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And blood glucose is looking really good. But the other That's what we're tackling now. Yeah, exactly. We're working on that now. You know what I'm saying? Everything else, you know, she's doing fantastic. So uh, anyway. That's, that's my offer. These are the things you need to know. If you're going to work with me, you know, that's why I love working with people like Zoe, I'll be honest with you, because she came in and she went right to work. You know what I'm saying? Because there's two types of people I know I can't help. Number one is the one that I don't know what's wrong with them. And there are a few like that. I don't know what to do. Number two are the ones that won't help themselves. And, that, and that's the frustrating one, to be honest with you. I can refer you to somebody else, but if you won't help yourself, referring you to somebody else ain't going to help. So you got to be willing to make serious lifestyle changes. This is your life. This is your brain. This is your body. You have to be willing to make the change. I can't make them for you. And you must take accountability. You can't blame anybody else and you can't look to anybody else. Well, you can't look to your insurance company because they're only going to pay for a portion if, if any of this work, okay? Um, but here's the thing. With diabetics, if you're working with me only nutritionally, which most people in the room would be doing, the cost, the, the programs range from, I would say, less than $1,000 to $1,500 just doing nutritional metabolic work, okay? And in some cases, uh, now if you got peripheral neuropathies and you're not doing brain-based therapy already with me or something like that, then you can be up to $6,000, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it just depends. But, um, but seriously, guys, you've got to have somebody find out what you need to be doing and teach you how to do it. And you've got to really evaluate how serious this illness is to you. Is this something that, um, that you know, you're taking for granted? Because a lot of people do. And, and I'll tell you, the medical doctors have played into this because they don't know what to tell you to do. They just tell you to take the drug and then they just try to try, try to act like everything's okay. But it's not. And you know it's not. 